When it came to planning the retaking of Western Europe, the Allies of World War II faced something of a problem. The great sword of Damocles that hangs over every large-scale military campaign? Logistics. It was fairly clear from shortly after the United States entering the war that the availability of men and firepower was not going to be a problem. Landing craft and other such specialised equipment could also be provided in time once the appropriate designs had been approved. Localised control of the landing area could also mostly be counted on thanks to the combination of numbers and technology such as radar, which would obviate at night attacks and such like. But all of this would be pointless without the logistics to back up the invasion. You could land whole armies on day one, but if they ran out of ammunition and food by day three, then all you were doing was giving the Germans a bit of a bureaucratic nightmare as they'd have to set about rapidly creating a whole new system of prisoner of war camps. This issue, in turn, would influence the choices made in where the landing should take place. Not all locations are created equal. But the square cube law meant that a single 10,000 ton freighter could physically transport far more bulk goods than 10 smaller 1,000 ton supply ships, and each of those could carry considerably more than 10 small 100 ton landers. But adapted landing craft and other relatively shallow draft vessels could land almost anywhere that wasn't just a mess of rocks and cliffs, whereas a large cargo ship would be restricted by the depth of water offshore as to where it could physically go. A landing beach might be perfect for putting men ashore, but if kilotons of supplies were stranded a mile out to sea, it was all going to be fairly pointless. Now, you might think, why not bring the big ships to just offshore and then unload them via a relay chain of smaller vessels? Well, this could be made to work, especially on a short-term basis, but it ran into another issue. Throughput. Due to the above-mentioned volume issues, it would take a long time for smaller craft to offload a larger ship, and then be offloaded themselves in, in turn, then they'd have to go back to the larger ship and repeat until that larger vessel was empty. It would also restrict the size of what could be transported to whatever the safe single load capacity of the smaller craft was, or what the load capacity was of the larger ship's onboard cranes, whichever of the two happened to be smaller. And that, in turn, would mean that some items couldn't be transported at all. The time that all of this took would also act as a bottleneck, because whilst the freighter was at anchor waiting for the next partial unloading, it couldn't be heading back to friendly ports to load up again. And of course, the longer a ship full of potentially flammable, potentially even explosive supplies remained stationary, the more likely it was that some enterprising Luftwaffe pilot or coastal defence gunner would find an opportunity to blow it up. The last of the big three issues when it came to logistics was the weather. Any open beach would be subject to the whims of wind and sea, so even if the perfect landing spot could be found, a week of storms and heavy seas might cut off the troops from resupply as effectively as if some dark ritual had suddenly raised a line of cliffs where before there had only been gently sloping sands. Now, all of these problems, as well as other smaller ones, had been encountered by humanity before, mostly in the course of trying to trade. The solution was, of course, the protected harbour or port, and plenty of those existed on the French coast. Unfortunately, since these places tend to be rather large and well known, they're obvious targets to both sides when thinking about mounting or defending against an invasion. Indeed, the British had, a few years earlier, prepared swathes of documents for plans on how to defend and then to destroy their own ports if any German invasion had proved successful in targeting them, and they could only assume that the Germans had done the same thing for the French Channel ports. Plus, thanks to the fact that ports tend to have a fairly long history associated with them, the harbours tended to be built in defensible locations and weren't exactly short on pre-existing fortifications either. So whilst the most obvious solution might seem to be to attack and seize a port that had all the needed heavy lift equipment, deep water channels and jetties to facilitate the rapid offloading of equipment and men, it was such an obvious solution that everybody knew it would be a costly effort that would probably yield only a mined, half-demolished death trap that was probably also on fire. A smaller, less obvious port might be more easily captured, but it would also be far more limited in how much it could offload. So it seems they were back to square one. How to deliver 
something approximating over 15,000 tonnes of supplies on day one, rapidly rising to 25,000 tonnes and more in a few weeks as more and more men arrived. However, a solution was already percolating through the minds of some of the brighter Allied inventors, engineers and strategists. Building a new harbour was already something people knew about, where nature or strategic necessity meant that there was half of the equation to a secure port, human ingenuity had been building the other half for thousands of years, everywhere from Carthage and Caesarea Maritima in ancient times, through to more recent artificial harbours, both completed and half-finished, all along the Channel coast on both sides from various ironclad invasion scares. The problem here was that the Germans were somewhat unlikely to allow a macro-scale engineering project to be set up on the French coast and run for a few years with the express purpose of bringing many angry men with guns in the Germans' direction. Enter Transportation 5, a branch of the UK War Office within the larger War Office Transportation Department. Transportation, or TN5, was responsible for port engineering. They'd already built a number of new military ports in the UK to relieve pressure on civilian ports that were not designed for the level of wartime traffic that was coming into them, and they were actually an army-based organisation. Since the War Office had taken the view that in peacetime the Admiralty was in charge of naval docks and shipping moving in and out of these and other large ports, but the larger freighter and passenger ports themselves had been run by civil authorities and thus the army had been given charge of the care and maintenance of harbours that were not completely related to warship activity, ostensibly to let the Admiralty get on with the business of actually building ships and sending them out to sea to fight things. That isn't to say that TN5 worked alone. The Department of Naval Construction and the Department of Miscellaneous Weapons Development would both provide significant assistance both of these being Admiralty-controlled organisations, uh, the latter of which being one of a number of various British organisations whose overall goal can best be described as taking a collection of mad scientists, garden-shed inventors, young troublemakers, pyromaniacs and cat herders, giving them all a warehouse of interesting spare parts and locking them up in there after telling them that if they came up with something interesting that might help them beat the Nazis, there might even be a second or possibly even a third warehouse in it for them. A disturbingly large proportion of Britain's more unusual and effective weapons and technologies of the time would come from individuals that were either part of or connected to such places. The first thing that these people realised was that any harbour would have to be built in the UK and then taken over to France. Uh, the next thing they realised was that any potential harbour would be far too large to make in a single piece, so it would have to be built in sections and then carefully assembled on the other side of the channel. In order to persuade the higher-ups of the validity of the concept and therefore the need to fund it, Lord Mountbatten arranged a lecture on the liner Queen Mary, which was at the time taking the Prime Minister and a rather distinguished party over to North America. A selection of senior officers were thus dutifully assembled in one of the ship's larger bathrooms, where a demonstration was given by Professor J.D. Bernal, a well-respected physicist and one of Mountbatten's chief scientific advisers. Uh, standing, with all due ceremony, on a lavatory seat, Admiral Sir Dudley Pound, the first sea lord, invited his colleagues to imagine the shallow end of the bath adjacent as a beachhead. Bernal now floated, with the assistance of Lieutenant Commander D.A. Grant, a fleet of 20 ships that had been constructed out of today's newspaper. Grant was then requested to make waves with the aid of a back brush, and the fleet sank. A May West lifebelt was then found, inflated, and floated in the bath so as to represent a harbour. A brand new fleet of paper boats was then placed inside it, and once more Grant applied his brush vigorously to create waves but this time they failed to sink the fleet. The demonstration, believe it or not, actually worked, given that this was the same Mountbatten who would later blast away at a chunk of pikecrete with a pistol in a room full of senior Allied commanders. I can only imagine it must have been a fun old time being on his staff during the war. Nonetheless, the party reached Canada, and US engineers were brought north to enter the discussion, and they introduced something that they'd come up with, the Rhino Ferry. This was a collection of rectangular steel pontoons that would either be chained together whilst afloat and used to make a somewhat undulating but entirely workable raft upon which vehicles could be placed and then towed ashore, 
or they could be flooded and used as causeways to allow ships to offload vehicles without having to beach themselves and wait for the next high tide. However, these did have limitations in terms of how deep water they could be sunk in if you were using the causeway option. They were vulnerable in their fixed and in their floating formats to heavy weather, and they were somewhat limited in terms of what you could actually put on them. But nonetheless, they provided a key part of the equation, as it meant that smaller craft could use these Rhino ferries to offload men and vehicles inside a much larger, calmed artificial harbour, with almost 24-7 operation guaranteed by being in the sheltered waters. Whilst the more substantial British proposals could make up the harbour walls themselves, and could be used to move larger and heavier items, thus capitalising on the multiplicity of craft of all sizes that could be made to be present on the beaches. Now things became a bit more complicated. The need to offload heavy equipment like tanks meant earlier proposals on making calm harbour areas with breakwaters formed entirely of bubbles had to be abandoned. Uh, the bubble walls had shown some promise in testing, but they were less effective in severe weather, and of course they had no intrinsic carrying capacity of their own. Uh, their use as breakwaters was further complicated by the lack of powerful enough pumps for the calculated amount of airflow that would be required. Hydrographers needed to be brought in to work out the depth of the water, the fall off of the seabed, the nature of the seabed, the effects of prevailing currents and so forth, as it would be no use to put in a solid barrier only to have the current build up massive amounts of sand on one side and around its tip, thus blocking its use to shipping, whilst the same current scoured away the beach on the downstream side of the flow and made it impossible to land small craft. This is an issue that is often still missed in modern coastal engineering projects. And then there was the matter of how to build the harbour itself. The most visible and obvious part of a harbour is the breakwater, which ensures that the water is calmer on the inside of the harbour than it is outside. But only rarely do ships ever dock alongside it. Occasionally this will happen on the inside of a major breakwater like the Zeebrugge Mole, but for something that was going to be substantially less massive, it, that wasn't going to be a particularly viable plan. Plus, a great arcing breakwater would make a really nice long target for German forces. And so the plan became installing a series of piers and pontoons, plus the Rhino ferries and other smaller craft, all of which would be enclosed within a series of considerably larger breakwaters. The extra advantage of this was that it meant the breakwaters could at least in part be made up of old ships scuttled in place, which would be somewhat cheaper and easier to arrange than purpose-built structures. The plan had one other small complication. Whilst American involvement was of course welcome, all of the production had to be done in the UK, for the simple reason that, apart from the final crossing to France, any transit of the harbour components could be done in coastal waters in the UK, whilst any components made in the United States would have to be slowly towed across the Atlantic, and there was neither the tugs nor the extended calm weather windows that would allow for that. Two such harbours were therefore planned, one for the American forces, which would be assembled off Omaha Beach, and the other for the British and Canadian forces, which would be assembled off of Gold Beach. Plus, additional old vessels would be provided for creating breakwaters at Utah, Juneau and Sword Beaches to facilitate more general landing activities. The two big harbours would be codenamed Mulberry A and Mulberry B, uh, the letters also happily happening to denote American and British, respectively. But what to make these portable harbours from? And how did one test these ideas' effectiveness before actually heading over to France? Enter Garleston, Scotland. As it turned out, its beach gradient and tidal range were very similar to the chosen landing areas in Normandy, and it happened to be miles away from anywhere with any significant population, and thus the testing could be done in secret. Here, a wide variety of different structures with interesting code names were tried, some successful, others perhaps less so. One of the smallest tried was codenamed Swiss Roll. This was essentially a long stretch of treated canvas sewn around and to various wooden beams, which were then all bound up with steel cabling, which allowed for both flexibility and strength. The code name came from its appearance when it was rolled up for transport. 
The idea being to unroll a floating walkway for fairly little expense or mass. If a section was dipped into the water by a local point load, then canvas walls with flotation aids attached remained on the surface and would create a water-free space. It worked pretty well for troops, but anything motorised tended to be heavy enough to make it sink beyond the depth that the walls would cover. It would of course refloat itself once the load was gone, but drowned engines and tanks being dumped off the side into the channel were not a feature that would be particularly desirable in the middle of an invasion, and the idea was dropped. Albeit a small number of already produced units would be taken over just in case, and used for a short time to allow the offloading of troops separate to the heavy gear at some of the British and Canadian beaches. One of the more ambitious efforts were so-called hippo piers. These were vaguely streamlined concrete caissons with significant steel upperworks. The idea was that they would be sunk in place, and then steel roads, called crocodiles, would join them together, forming a high-flying bridge for the movement of many types of goods, the high-flying part being necessary because of the immense tidal range of the Normandy beaches. Unfortunately, the effort needed to make the caissons light enough to float when pumped out, when they also had all this extra steel atop them, meant that they ended up being too light to resist the currents when they sank, and they tended to shift around, thus twisting the roadways into something resembling a low-level roller coaster, which would probably send all the precious supply trucks and their contents toppling into the sea, and so this too was out. The winners, as such, were a series of other ideas, such as the Phoenix Caissons. These big blocks of concrete looked a little bit like gigantic hollow breeze blocks, some with a modicum of shaping at either end for better sea keeping, and they could be towed into place, and then valves were opened, letting water into the voids inside, at which point they would sink to the seabed, where they could be anchored, forming a solid breakwater in addition to those formed by the scuttled ships. The advantage of these over the ships was of course that there was a finite number of disposable ships, whilst the caissons could be built to order. They could also, thanks to being flat at the top, be fitted with various defences like anti-aircraft gun platforms or barrage balloon mooring stations, and the AA guns thus mounted would enjoy a very wide field of fire. The reason for the Phoenix name was that by the simple expedient of closing the valves and then pumping them out, they could then be refloated and towed to a new location. This also made storage easier, as they could be built, and then sunk in a storage location just off the UK coast, and then refloated again shortly before D-Day and taken across the channel, as opposed to having to worry about them breaking free and floating away every time a storm hit. Uh, the fact that they then spent several months hiding underwater also meant it was much harder for the Luftwaffe to work out what the Allied plans actually were. Surviving ones after the operation could also then be refloated and removed, in the event that they might be found of better use elsewhere, or simply because the French might want their coastline back without massive lumps of concrete ruining the view. These Phoenix caissons came in a number of types that were built to various sizes and depths for use along the descending seabed, and so that the order they arrived in was just as important as getting them there in the first place. Outside of the Phoenixes and the scuttled ships, would be another kind of breakwater. These would be in deeper water, and therefore they couldn't go all the way down to the bottom, but the idea of these floating breakwaters was to reduce the initial wave height so that the damage to the breakwater ships and the phoenixes wouldn't be as great, thus prolonging their lifespan and making operations overall a lot easier. These so-called bombardons started life as weighted rubber tubes, but the design was revised to a steel and rubber structure with a cruciform cross-section. The lower three fins were ballasted with water and a bit of concrete, whilst the upper fin remained partially above the water thanks to its being filled with air, and thus blocked most of the wave action. The piers that would actually offload most of the ships and sit inside the breakwaters would be made out of three main components. The spud was a large steel pontoon which would form the pierhead, 
This was provided with a large steel leg at each corner, which could be dropped and anchored once the spud was in position, and thus as the tide rose and fell, the pontoon would do the same, travelling up and down the legs, which would allow for loading and unloading to continue, the legs keeping the thing in the same position linearly and laterally, just not vertically. These were then connected to the shore via floating roadways called whales that looked a little bit like small steel arched bridges, with each connecting section supported by a floating pontoon called a beetle, which was ideally to be made of steel but for speed of construction was often made in concrete. In this way the roadway from the pierhead to the beach rose and fell with the tide without inducing too steep a gradient. However, there was still a risk that this whole floating roadway might be twisted or broken away from the pierhead and beach fixed points by winds or cross currents, and so the designer of much of this collection, Alan Beckett, also invented a special kite anchor, which dug deeper into the seabed the more strain you put on it. These proved remarkably effective in testing, and even more so in practice, to the point that whilst the piers themselves were generally recovered after the liberation of Europe had cleared more traditional ports for use, most of the anchors had to be left in place, even post-war, since they tended to stay firmly fixed to the seabed and break things that tried to haul them out. One final element was that some of the whale sections were replaced with a variant of the design which could telescope in and out. This would allow the pier to compensate for the distance from pier head to beach being shorter at high tide and longer at low tide, as well as dealing with more general flexing along the length of the structure which could approach a mile long. With all of these issues sorted out, as the end of 1943 approached, production went into full swing, and plans were made on how to transport the various parts. Ships being scuttled could make their own way there, the Phoenix caissons would be brought over singly by pairs of tugs, a bombardons were towed a pair at a time by a single tug, and strings of whales and beetles were to towed over as whole component units, some of them even with their spuds attached to the front already, with the idea being that it would be much easier to join a few semi-completed sections together with the telescoping parts, rather than do every single bit one at a time just off of the beach. A total of 132 oceanic tugs were drawn from the UK and the United States to take part in the operation, with a few survivors from occupied Europe pitching in as well. Construction of all these parts had been a challenge, and a few had failed or been lost along the way, but more had been ordered than were needed, just in case, and as Operation Overlord commenced, so a relay race of components began. It didn't start that well. The night of the 6th of June saw the first of the Bombardons go in, but at the last minute they were ordered to lay a single line only, not the double line that had been planned. This reduced their overall effectiveness and it increased the strain on both the Bombardons themselves and on the other components that were to follow, which would have an effect somewhat later on. Additionally, thanks to the confusion of the last minute changes, they also ended up being anchored in water that was several fathoms too deep for their mooring lines to have a safe amount of slack, which would again come back to haunt the operation as the lines were subjected to a lot more strain than they were designed for. The ships being expended also went in at roughly the same time, which would notionally complete some of the outermost breakwater lines fairly early. The next day, on the 7th, the Phoenixes began their crossing, and the artificial harbours began to take shape in a true form. It still wasn't all plain sailing, some of them had to be chased down after breaking free of their tugs, and four were lost, two to enemy action and two in localised bad weather. And the final installation ended up being in deeper water and on a somewhat larger scale than the plan had actually called for, although it turned out this was just as well since even this expanded version was called on to be grown still further as Allied shipping piled into the calmed waters. Phoenix caissons would continue to be lost along with other components whilst under tow during the entire build and operation of the artificial harbours, but the loss rate was slightly below the overall predicted levels. By the end of the 9th, the pier sections had begun to arrive, and unlike the development and preparation phase, where the British and the Americans had, uh, shall we say, not gotten along especially well, once faced with the practical situation of securing their inventions in the face of enemy fire, the two groups tended to get along exceptionally well. 
In fact, the biggest arguments that were witnessed during the construction period were between Brigadier Walter of the Royal Engineers and some of the American motor tow launch crews over the merits of various baseball teams, which the British officer was mysteriously incredibly well informed about, to the bafflement of all involved. Extreme skill on the part of everybody was needed to ensure that the sections of pier were slotted together in an active sea. But by the 14th, the first full pier was ready, and three-ton trucks began rolling down it and ashore. Uh, one officer on Mulberry B, which was the British one, a Lieutenant Colonel J. R. Sainsbury, no apparent relation to the supermarket, found himself at something of a loose end, and resolved to go around and ensure that every single one of the beetle floats was properly anchored, something which he found had been a bit overlooked during the assembly process, which had been understandably rushed. He then found a team of sappers and some spare steel wire, and as well as ensuring the anchors were all in place, he began wiring the floats to each other as well. There were some delays as a number of the beetle floats sank whilst under tow, largely thanks to having been designed as steel, but as we said earlier, many of them had been made of concrete to save materials and time, and the latter proving eventually to be somewhat less seaworthy than hoped for. But despite occasional sniper fire and the like, soon there were tanks, trucks and various other things rolling down the piers at both American and British harbours. For comparison, an LST, or landing ship tank, could be brought up, unloaded and sent on its way from one of the piers in just over an hour, whilst the same ship, if it ran ashore and then unloaded, had to wait for the tide to float it off and that would take about half a day. Thus, the piers ensured that supplies could flow at least 12 times as fast as the LST would manage by simply driving up onto the beach. Around them were swarms of DUKWs, otherwise known as ducks, rhino ferries and other smaller craft making themselves busy ferrying things to shore as well. During the second week of the landings, the Luftwaffe made a concerted effort to attack the harbours, but the sheer scale of Allied fighter cover and anti-aircraft firepower meant that pretty quickly high-altitude mine laying became the main and later only form of offence. Pressure-sensitive mines, which were activated by the ship displacing water around it as it moved along, couldn't be countered by degaussing or by regular sweeping, as they could sink right to the bottom and thus didn't have any lines to cut, and just wait for a ship to pass over them. Luckily, as it turned out, most of the pressure fuses were far too sensitive and many of the mines that were dropped were set off either by their impact in the water or by particularly large waves in the high tides of Normandy. But with so many crew building and manning the harbours, it was also fair to see when and where a mine landed. At Mulberry B, it was made known generally that anyone who located a mine would get a bottle of scotch as a reward, which helped to improve the vigilance of the workers. One day, however, a massive explosion in the harbour caught everyone's attention, which led them to witness a hapless duck surfing the plume of an anti-shipping mine's detonation, first up, then down, and then all the way to the beach. Incredibly, the crew and the vehicle survived the experience, coming ashore to find a message from the commander of the building efforts that he was surprised to see duck crews had decided to add minesweeping to their roster of duties. Uh, summoned to meet him once they dried off, and then presented with their bottle of scotch, they promptly asked, had anyone seen any other mines fall in the area recently? <laughs> but now the biggest test would come. The weather got worse on the 16th and 17th, with parts of the harbour still incomplete. The 18th seemed somewhat brighter, but two weather systems, one coming in from Iceland and one from the Mediterranean, were on course to collide over the channel on the 19th. Upon receiving these reports, Brigadier Walter at Mulberry B ordered all existing moorings, thanks to Sainsbury already prodigious, to be doubled up. All shipping was to be moved to the lee side of the piers so that they would not be driven against or impact on them, and the pier heads were raised to their highest possible level without leaving the water completely. All tugs were stocked fully with fuel and food, and told that if anything broke loose they were to try and get a line on it, and if that wasn't possible, they were also given a series of anti-tank rocket launchers with which to sink offending breakwater sections that might have gotten free. On the 19th, the gale broke, reaching force 7 and sending 8-foot waves crashing into the harbours even after the breakwater reductions. This would then go on for three days. 
the pier and breakwater crews clinging on for dear life, whilst tug crews scuttled across the water chasing down errant vessels blown off the beaches or the occasional harbour component, with the men manning the piers snagging some of the ones that drifted too close for comfort with rocket pistols, which fired lightweight cables over wandering out-of-control craft which the crews of the said craft could then use to haul aboard thicker lines by which they could then be brought alongside. At Mulberry B, parts of the piers began to twist, bolts were torn out, a few spans broke free, and others were saved by heroic men who jumped from one awash moving section to another, at all times only seconds away from being washed into the sea and then smashed back up against the concrete and steel. Some of the phoenixes were overtopped, and since they didn't have any cap, they were filled by waves, the uneven pressure then splitting them open and the Bombardon line, already strained, fell apart completely. Luckily, the tugs were able to secure or sink most of these errant devices. Over at Mulberry A, the Seabees fought just as hard to save their harbour, but some of the earlier decisions made over their heads left them fighting a losing battle. Uh, without as many anchors placed or the cross-wiring, they faced far more components from their piers breaking loose or beginning to fill with water, which in turn left fewer of them to guard against incoming small craft like LCTs that were unable to fight the racing currents. These collisions then compounded the damage and it be all began to spiral. Two of the piers were completely ruined, ending up being bent out of shape in arcs of permanently deformed steel. Here, also, the tugs hadn't been prepared as well, and so as well as the overtopping pressure on the phoenixes, they were struck by a succession of stray bombardons, overall leading to the destruction of two-thirds of the phoenix breakwater units. When the wind abated, the British harbour was rapidly on its way to repair, with spare replacement parts being brought over from the English coast, but it was different at Mulberry A, where some believed the situation could be salvaged, but others, mostly those who previously expressed disapproval of the whole idea in the first place, did not. The latter managed to get their, their opinion up the chain of command first, and as a result, only the breakwater ships were to be kept. They were also being used to offload supplies from larger craft to smaller ones with some impromptu deck plating. Mulberry B would remain, with any remaining damage shored up by surviving parts of Mulberry A that could be salvaged. Mulberry B was also to be reinforced. The original plan had been for both harbours to operate for about three months before anticipated captures of other ports would see their use stop. In fact, Mulberry B would be used for the rest of 1944, with more caissons and the like being brought in to double up the breakwater line, although a higher than expected amount of supplies ended up being landed onto the beaches, the amount and type of supplies landed on the harbour constructions could not be understated, especially when it came to being able to directly unload Liberty ships. It was far closer to the front lines than Cherbourg, and for several months Le Havre was either in enemy hands, and then subsequently still within disturbingly easy striking range of German counter-efforts. But eventually various large ports fell into Allied hands, were repaired, and the front lines moved beyond the ability of the Germans to easily hit them, and so, by November 1944, Mulberry A was formally decommissioned. But there were two last roles for the various components that made it up to play. Some of the Phoenixes were refloated and moved off east to repair bomb damage to seawalls and dikes, and whale sections from the piers were lifted up and carted inland where they were used as ready-made re replacement bridges where the originals had either been bombed or blown up. Some of them are still in place even today. The last major use of the caissons was in 1953, when the Netherlands was subjected to major floods as various sea defences failed in the face of a major storm. Some of the larger gaps in those defences were then plugged by a number of Phoenix caissons that were brought over from the UK. Those caissons are still there, having been turned into museums about the floods as the defences around them have gradually been improved. A few others, some whale bridges inland, and a variety of individual components that broke loose or otherwise failed whilst in storage or under construction, can still be seen around the UK coast. And finally, a number of the original units are still in place off the coast of France, particularly the remains of Mulberry B's Phoenix Breakwater. <laughs>
The lessons that would be learned from all these efforts would be carried through by those who developed and used them back into the civilian world, and a number of advances and concepts that are used in 1944 are still used today in maritime engineering, both military and civilian. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.